This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and welcome to the final episode of Messed Up Origins in 2021. This is the last time we're gonna see each other until Yuletide celebrations are over. Literally. My next post will be on January 6th, the very same day that the three wise men showed up in Bethlehem and said, eh, I'm pretty sure that's God's baby. Some might call it a coincidence, others may say it's prophecy. Either way, we've got some pretty insane topics in next year's lineup, so I recommend tuning in. Now at this point, we're coming toward the end of the holiday season. Christmas is in just a few days, which means you've no doubt had plenty of time to be exposed to the usual holiday tropes. Cringy Christmas cards, houses covered with so many lights they could be a second sun, awkward conversations with your in-laws, almost breaking your neck on black ice. The holidays truly are a magical time of year. I've got to say though, one tradition that I've never understood is kissing under the mistletoe. What is it about that plant that makes anyone standing under it have to kiss each other? I mean, it's not particularly sexy. We don't have many practical uses for it and it's considered to be parasitic. No, mistletoe does not turn me on at all. So what's the deal? Who's the freak that decided mistletoe was the official mascot of unsolicited smooches? And when did it start making appearances in songs, movies, and other avenues of pop culture? Merry Christmas, Sheriff. Say, isn't that mistletoe? Mm -hmm. That is exactly what we're trying to find out today. And to get the answer, we're gonna have to analyze Greek, Norse, and for the first time ever, Druidic mythology. Before we jump into it, if you enjoy content like this where we ruin your favorite fairy tales, myths, and traditions with the truth, be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons. Like I said, I'll be taking next week off, but come January 6th, you can expect more messed up content in your sub box every Thursday. If you were to Google the origins of mistletoe, the results would consist of various articles posted by magazines and news outlets, as well as a few seemingly reliable history books that claim that mistletoe has been part of December celebrations since the days of the Roman Empire and the festival of Saturnalia. Saturnalia, for those who don't know, was a yearly event that honored Saturn, the Roman equivalent of Cronus, Zeus's father. He was a deity of agriculture, wealth, periodic renewal, and generations. So when the new year was about to start, great sacrifices were made in his honor. We don't actually know much regarding the specifics of how it was celebrated, but the Encyclopedia Romana gives a pretty solid description of the usual festivities and even quotes the Roman poet Lucian in the process. Slaves were treated as equals, allowed to wear their master's clothing and be waited on at mealtime in remembrance of an earlier golden age thought to have been ushered in by the god. In the Saturnalia, Lucian has the god himself declare that during my week, the Sirius is barred, no business allowed. Drinking, noise and games and dice, appointing of kings and feasting of slaves, singing naked, clapping of frenzied hands, an occasional ducking of corked faces and icy water, such are the functions over which I preside. Figs, nuts, dates, and other dainties were showered on the people, women and children, men and senators alike, and bread and wine served among the rows while guests were entertained by women fighting in the arena and cranes were hunted by dwarves. This freedom from work and social egalitarianism enjoyed on Saturnalia resembled the conditions of the mythical Golden Age when Cronus still ruled the world. In the Golden Age, the earth had spontaneously supported human life, and since labor was unneeded, slavery had not existed. In other words, it was a party. What's strange, though, is that neither mistletoe nor any of its epithets are mentioned in the Encyclopedia Romana, nor in Lucian's poem about Saturnalia, where Saturn himself describes exactly how he wants people to celebrate, nor in the writings we have about the Greek equivalent of the ceremony called Cronia. So I'm not sure where the specific idea that the festival is connected with mistletoe and the kissing tradition comes from. Though I can tell you from experience that the plant is barely even mentioned in any of the Roman writings we've discovered. The only notable appearance it makes is in the sixth book of the Aeneid, an epic written by the Roman poet Virgil, where the Trojan hero Aeneas has to retrieve the golden bough, a tree branch with golden leaves, in order to travel through the underworld safely. Spoiler alert, he ends up being successful, and thanks to the golden bough, he gets a free ride from Charon the boatman, and is allowed to enter the green fields of Elysium, where he meets with his father to discuss the future Roman Empire. If you haven't put it together yet, the golden bough is believed to be mistletoe. We can't be 100% certain, but that's a detail that most experts agree on. And while it is interesting there was something special about the mistletoe that allowed Aeneas to traverse the underworld safely, I don't see how that could possibly be connected to the kissing tradition. The Romans aren't the only culture to be mislabeled as the source of mistletoe smooches though. So let's talk about another mythology with a rather notorious mistletoe myth.
Another myth that's commonly held responsible for the locking of lips every Christmas comes from Norse mythology. And if you're at all familiar with the mythos, you already know what myth that's gonna be. I am of course referring to the death of Baldur. Spoiler alert, but yeah, he dies. If you wanna hear the complete story, then I recommend you check out the episode where I break down the entire mythology of Baldur, but today I'm giving you the short version. Basically what happens is Odin receives a prophecy that Baldur is going to die. And that's horrible news for the Aesir because Baldur is the most perfect one among them. And when he dies, Ragnarok, the end of the world, commences. As an attempt to save her beloved son and by extension the world, Baldur's mother Frigg traveled across the nine realms, extracting promises from everything that she could find, weapons, animals, rocks, and monsters, that they wouldn't hurt Baldur. The only thing in the universe she didn't take an oath from was the mistletoe. So naturally, when the mischievous Loki found out about this, he gathered as much of the plant as he could find, fashioned it into a dart, spear, or arrow, depending on the translation, and tricked the blind god Hod into throwing it at his brother Baldur, impaling and killing him. This story is the only place in the entirety of the Prose Edda and Poetic Edda where Mistletoe makes an appearance. And I don't know about you, but I don't see any way how this could be connected to the kissing tradition. There's an assortment of blog posts, magazine articles, and even some history books that claim it was Frigg's declaration that inspired it. Supposedly, instead of punishing the Mistletoe for killing her perfect son, she pronounced it a symbol of peace, and that should anyone meet under it, they must lay down their weapons and cease fighting until the following day. Also, her tears that fell on the mistletoe turned into berries. Can't forget that part. Or maybe I can, because that detail is nowhere to be found in the actual text. I used two of the most highly praised translations of the Prose Edda and Poetic Eddas, link below if you want them, and I couldn't find a single line about mistletoe that could even be interpreted that way, nor could I in any of the Viking sagas. Now, I don't doubt that mistletoe did have some significance in Norse culture. You would think there has to be a reason why they made it Baldur's Kryptonite, and we're fairly confident that it was a staple of their Yuletide celebrations, which is how it got incorporated into Christmas in the first place. I just don't believe that whatever significance they gave it has anything to do with peace. Plus the idea of two Norsemen engaged in a battle to the death having to suddenly stop because someone noticed they happened to be standing under mistletoe sounds like some new agey spiritual fairy tale woo woo. I mean, do you really think that a Viking going berserk over the murder of his family and the ransacking of his farm isn't going to get revenge just because the Marauder set up their camp under some mistletoe? Of course not. So no matter what Moonstone Naturopathics website tells you, or even the more reliable sounding LearnReligions.com, trust me when I say there is no evidence the kissing tradition comes from Norse myth. Yet another mythos that mistletoe has supposed significance in is Druidism, a certain sect of the ancient Celtic cultures. And I'll be honest, I'm not nearly as well versed in this as I am Greek and Norse mythology. In my defense though, it doesn't appear that anyone actually knows a whole lot about the Druids. Just like the Norse, they preferred oral storytelling to writing things down. So pretty much everything we know about them comes from secondhand sources like Julius Caesar's commentaries on the Gaelic War. According to Pliny the Elder, a Roman author, intellectual, and military man, the Druids considered mistletoe to be highly sacred and believed that every tree that mistletoe grew on was selected by God himself as an object of his special affection. In his book called Natural History, he claims they also had a special ceremony to harvest it, where on the fifth day of the moon, one of the priests would climb a tree and cut out the mistletoe with a golden sickle while others waited below them to catch it, ensuring that it doesn't touch the ground. The biggest takeaway that we get from his writings when it comes to the plant being connected to the modern day kissing tradition is its association with fertility. This is another factoid that you'll see online, that the Druids thought mistletoe could cure infertility. Pliny is even cited as the source for that information most of the time. But again, and I probably sound like a broken record at this point, when you read the actual text, this is all it says on the matter. It is the belief with them that the mistletoe taken in drink will impart fecundity to all animals that are barren and that it is an antidote for all poisons. One single line about healing animals that are infertile not even people. I guess you could extrapolate from that and the antidote for all poisons line and say that human infertility falls under that umbrella, but I'm surprised that such a widely repeated claim wouldn't be stated more clearly. Another fascinating detail is how he ends his explanation by saying, such are the religious feelings we find entertained toward trifling objects among nearly all nations. And the way I interpret that is, so that's one example of how objects that mean nothing to some cultures can mean everything to others. And while I don't wanna make too many assumptions, it sounds 
sounds to me like he's saying the mistletoe isn't significant in his own culture among the Romans, which makes me question the popular claim that they considered the mistletoe to be a symbol of peace, love, and understanding. At the very least, it sounds like reverence for the mistletoe was peculiar to the Druids and not very widespread, so you can't help but wonder, when did people start kissing underneath this thing? It turns out the tradition of mistletoe makeout sessions may not be as old as we've been led to believe. In fact, it may not go beyond the 1700s. The reason I say this is because of a little essay called A Dissertation Concerning Mistletoe. A most wonderful specific remedy for the cure of convulsive tempers calculated for the benefit of the poor as well as the rich and heartily recommended for the common good of mankind. A catchy name if I do say so myself. In this dissertation, Sir John Callback, a professor of moral philosophy at Cambridge University, just kidding, I know it's Cambridge, but it's really funny to me how mad you Brits get about that kind of thing. It's a prestigious university. How dare you pronounce it how it's spelled. Anyway, in 1720, Sir John Callback wrote an entire dissertation about the use of mistletoe throughout history, and even had a whole section dedicated to superstitions and customs. But curiously, nowhere in his writings does he mention the kissing tradition, and considering that we supposedly took the custom from cultures that existed not just centuries, but thousands of years prior, you would think that he would have known about it. But no, we have zero written record of kissing and mistletoe having anything to do with each other until 1784. In a musical called Two for One, there was a song that went, When at Christmas in the hall, the men and maids are hopping. If by chance I hear them ball, amongst them quick I pop in. What all the men, Jim, John, and Joe, cry what good luck has sent ye, and kiss beneath the mistletoe, the girl not turned of twenty. So there you have it. We don't know exactly when or how the custom came about, but the written evidence indicates that it was somewhere in the 65 year span between Sir John Colback's essay and that musical's release. Personally, I like author Mark Forsyth's simple and straightforward theory that it involved a particularly lusty and inventive boy and a particularly gullible girl. I can totally picture that scene where a skirt chasing Chadwick, a British Barney Stinson, is at a Christmas party trying to win some girl's affections, but she rejects him and he has to get creative. But that was over in Britain. When did the trend cross the pond and become a thing here in America? That is actually much easier to trace. There's no guarantee, but many attribute it to the popularity of Washington Irving's The Sketchbook, which was published in seven installments in 1820 and contains stories like Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Washington was born and raised in America, but his mother was English, and he spent a ton of time studying and living in England, so he was no doubt aware of the trend, which is why he included it in his story called Christmas Eve where he wrote about a bunch of outlandish Christmas trends he'd seen in Europe. Here we kept up the old games of Hoodman Blind, Shoe the Wild Mare, Hot Cockles, Steal the White Loaf, Bob Apple, and Snapdragon. The Yule Clog and Christmas Candle were regularly burnt, and the mistletoe with its white berries hung up to the imminent peril of all the pretty housemaids. The mistletoe is still hung up in farmhouses and kitchens at Christmas, and the young men have the privilege of kissing the girls under it, plucking each time a berry from the bush. When the berries are all plucked, the privilege ceases. Okay, forget the mistletoe. I want to know what hot cockles and steal the white loaf are. It's so fucking weird what people used to do for fun. Anyway, when it comes to the messed up origins of mistletoe, that is everything we've got. It's not connected to Greek mythology, Norse mythology, or Druidic worship. In all likelihood, it was just some sleazy lad's way to get a kiss out of some broad that he liked. Maybe he told his friends about his clever idea, or she told hers. Either way, it caught on, and centuries later, it's still a staple of the holiday. And now a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. This is it everybody, we're only a few weeks away from a brand new year, 2022. And as far as years go, I hear it's gonna be a big one, so you definitely wanna start it off on the right foot. That means finally breaking out of your comfort zone, pursuing your passion project, and sharing your talents with the world. And there's no one that makes that easier than Squarespace. For years now, they've been empowering creators from all walks of life and with interests of every kind to finally establish their presence online by building a website. And hey, I know that sounds like a tall order when you first hear it, but Squarespace makes the design process so much easier than you'd expect. You start by answering a short survey detailing what your site is about, you pick a few of your goals, choose what stage best describes where you are in your process, and suddenly dozens of templates appear at your fingertips that are best suited for what you need. I follow the same steps to build my website, MessedUpOrigins.com. And even though I have no experience with web design, I was able to add links to my different series playlists, a list of books I like to use in my research, and 
including affiliate links, a gallery to show off the solo fam's art, and even a link to my merch store. And I of course have to plug my favorite part, all of these features are offered without forcing you to download, patch, or install anything ever. You can build an entire website in the very same browser that you online shop and watch YouTube videos in. So to those who are ready to grab next to your by the horns and finally pursue your passion, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to try out the service completely free. Then when your dream project is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase. Solo fam, thank you so much for watching this episode of Messed Up Origins, the final episode of 2021. I know I'm not alone when I say it's been a crazy fucking year with some record highs and soul shattering lows, but overall, it's been about 365 days worth of personal growth. I'm incredibly proud of the progress I've made this year and the goals I've accomplished, hitting 1 million subscribers being one of them, and I wanna talk to you guys about some of the exciting things we're planning in 2022. It's gonna be a weird year for sure, but you'll hear more about that in a few weeks. Keep your eyes on your sub boxes. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this video and want more content like this in your sub box and recommended feed, be sure to gift wrap those like and subscribe buttons and don't forget the bow on top. To stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, send me something directly, or just let me know what you got for Christmas, you can hit me up on my socials. Either search John Solo or hit the links down below. And at this point, it goes without saying, but if you want some adorable smushy faces on your timeline, then give my pups a follow as well. If you do follow them, just wait until you see them open their Christmas presents. They're gonna go nuts. Once again, thank you all so much for tuning in, not just to this episode, but this year's worth of content. Your support means more to me than I could concisely put into words, so I'll just save you the time and say thanks. I'll see you all on January 6th with another 52 weeks of messed up content incoming. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Happy, Happy New, New Year, Year Solo, Solo fam! fam.